Ackerley. We are live on Facebook, and I know we have a lot of our ICI friends watching, and we have um, other people, and we'll repost this on ICI webs or the uh, Facebook page, and then it'll be on my YouTube page. So I know we'll get a lot of viewers because everybody wants to hear from you. Um, I want to introduce you formally, but just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. I will try to keep a little bit of tabs as we're talking on those questions and answer them as we're going. Um, we've got lots of new and exciting things to talk about today that you maybe haven't heard yet. And um, then if you want to watch replays, you can watch them here, or I have a YouTube channel. It's just under my name, jillcarnahan.com, all free content and interviews. And um, we're going to have a lot of the ICI board members on those. So be sure and check back there for reruns and um, other videos if you're interested. So I first want to introduce um, my guest, Dr. Mary Ackerley. Um, I just have such great respect for the hard work and effort that she's put in. She is the co-founder and former president of ICI, that's I-S-E-A-I, -E for International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness, of which we've both been on the board. Um, and of course, she's been the former president, really, really has taken a great leadership role in this group. And today, I can't wait to talk about some of the directions where we're going, some of the new treatments, and some of the um, new ideas that are coming out of this group. Um, she's a classically trained uh, board-certified psychiatrist. She graduated Kuma, summa cum laude from Harvard University, studied at NIMH, this finished her residency at John Hopkins and was certified in psychiatry and neurology. She holds, holds an active medical license in Arizona and Florida, and she's a gifted speaker on many different avenues, has been on the board of the uh, Certified Integrative and Holistic Medicine. And as I mentioned, she was co-founder of uh, the ICI and uh, just recently retired president, still on the board, still incredibly active. Um, Mary, Dr. Ackerley, we are just delighted to have you here. Um, so welcome, first of all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And then second um, of all, I always like to start with story. So I'm going to just be quiet and let you dive in and kind of how you got to where you're at, especially with interest to mold and Lyme and some of the more complex chronic diseases that we're seeing so much of nowadays. That's a really long story, I think, and it's a story... <laughs> of a journey. And some of it I've talked about before, about how I somehow stumbled into mold, um, beginning to treat some of Dr. Gray's patients, who we all know is a wonderful doctor in Benson, um, for psychiatric illness that wouldn't get better. And I realized, wow, it's not all psychosomatic, that mold is real. And that, that is, you know, beginning like 2010, 2011, where I saw Mold is absolutely affecting their brains, and it's real, and it's not psychosomatic. So I've talked about that. Um, I think my journey begins, like any healer, really much, um, much earlier. And as you go and begin your own journeys, then these things come. And you do find them, because I think, like you, Jill, we're both curious. It's the things that get me most curious in life tend to be the things I don't know the things I haven't solved. So if I have people I'm seeing and I can't get them better, I begin very focused on what don't I know because I really do feel like we can get most people better if you know, if you ask the right questions. So that's an important part, I think, of my journey of just curiosity. But I think um, another part of my journey has been as part I don't talk about that much is that my father died when I was seven. Mm. And it was very sudden. And I was the oldest of four children. And my um, oldest of like, um, what was gonna become 26 grandchildren. I was actually wow. the second. And yeah, so it was Irish Catholic. Uh -huh. And it's a um, very big loving family. And my um, father died of melanoma. Mm. And worked for two years during Korea in a metal van, and um, he did the x-rays oh. without shielding probably. Mm -hmm. So there's no surprise he developed melanoma. And in thinking about that one day, I realized, well, I think I've <laughs> had a very early interest in the environmental impact of toxins on people. Mm -hmm. So it was um, a very big shock. Of a sudden, he was evidently in an experimental trial. And the shock of learning this, I was, really was daddy's girl. Yeah. Um, 
has been with me for a long time. And my mother's shock and trauma mm -hmm. was, um, I learned hypervigilance mm -hmm. um, at a very early age of learning to expect only bad news. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of stumbled through childhood and adolescence trying to figure out what happened, why did this happen, and also trying to deal with my own anxiety, what we now call, I was looking for vagal balance and maybe in some of the wrong ways, some of the right ways of learning to, there must be some way to kind of feel whole again, the way I know I used to feel, the way I knew my family was. And uh, so I think that brought me through a lot of journeys um, in college. I um, worked with um, Danny Goleman and Richie Davidson and uh, was a course on consciousness. And as a sophomore in college, it was the most exciting thing I'd ever heard. It's like they were talking things I wanted to know about, about God and spirit and consciousness and how our brains worked. And that was like, and this was very early, this is the 70s. So Danny Goldman went on to write emotional IQ books and get everyone interested in emotional as well as intellectual IQ. And Richie Davidson, who is my thesis advisor, is really well known for EEGs on monks and, and mindfulness. And in fact, I actually studied mindfulness like in 1976, I was in Barry, um, one of the first mindfulness um, retreats. And I can't say I fully appreciated where it would go but I've been doing mind-body balance forever, not understanding the words, but just knowing um, it wasn't normal to always go like this <laughs> whenever you drove a car or the bell rang unexpectedly. So, um, you know, I fast forward through medical school residency and getting board certified um, is the journey has been spiritual for me. I have um, done a lot of spiritual teachings in Tibet and they were pretty special wow. and come back um, and then sort of my own illnesses, not surprisingly, when you look back with autoimmunity and thyroid, feeling tired and depressed and people are sometimes surprised and say, you know, you don't have mold, why are you interested in treating it? And it's, it is because I just saw it was real but if you, I look back as like my residency, I was kind of tired and depressed, but you know, I was living in a hundred year old home oh, and yeah. we were renovating at the same time. It had a basement, four stories, you know, there was dust all over. I found out later I'd had high lead probably from that wow. renovation. It's very reasonable to think I was living in mold for a few mm -hmm. years and that was part of my being tired and feeling depressed. So um, I just grew up at a time when, you know, there weren't manuals uh, for like, how do you tell your daughter? Her father just died. Um, there weren't manuals like, you're depressed in residency, you know, suck it up and yeah. get through, not go look at your basement and do a dust test and right. send off a sample. <laughs> this was not the approach. No, it wasn't um, So. <laughs> And I think you've gone through that too, is that we now take for common was not even thought of at this time, yet you're experiencing things that you're trying to fix. Mm -hmm. So um, there have been certainly attempts, and that's how, as I learned with Hashimoto's, lots of stuff about diet, gluten, functional medicine, homeopathy, is that I wanted to talk about something, really my story, which I found um, interesting is that uh, last year or so I started something called vision therapy and it was um, my eyes are really bad and I just assumed you know you have bad eyesight it's what you're born with you have you know bad eyesight and it goes with big hands and big feet and um, marfanoid and stuff just assumed that's who I am and I um my progressives weren't working and some of my patients have done really well in vision therapy with Amy Thomas, who is a member of ICI. If she's listening, give her a big shout out. Yes. And they healed in ways I didn't understand. Their anxiety was getting better with getting new glasses. So that really interested me, but mostly I was hoping my glasses would work better. Mm -hmm. And I went to see her and she does some very unusual testing. Um, she explains it as basically, we have a visual map of the world in our brain and we have an auditory map of the world and they're supposed to line up. And when they line up, your eyes work together and both eyes are sending the same image to the brain and everything's fine. 
And then not surprisingly, in my case, she found, and she has you close your eyes and she rings little bells and you're touching uh-huh. at them. And it was general will go laugh because it is so weird. Wow. But you can just hear something and you can't touch it. And you know it's real. And then she puts on glasses and all of a sudden you can, with your eyes closed and hearing it, touch it. But the glasses and my eyes are closed. It's this whole idea of mapping and things working together. Is She said, you know, whatever is there, there's some sort of trauma there. Mm -hmm. And I got the glasses and I was on the way home wearing them. And all of a sudden, the whole trauma came. And I remembered the story of, of course, it was my father's casket. Yeah. And the death, and it was just vivid. And then I remembered that I was diagnosed as being really myopic after my father's death. And it was, you know, I want to put this in perspective, not to shock people, whatever, but it was a really pretty bad year. It's two months before my father died. Kennedy had been assassinated. And I got off a bus, and my mother and all the mothers are in a bus stop. Yeah. looking really scared and looking around for something that was going to happen and hustling us home and kind of telling us Kennedy had been shot. And there was no like drone following Kennedy. Nobody knew what had happened. It was just incredibly frightening. Then two months later, my own father died very suddenly. And then a couple of months later, um, my second grade teacher evidently went home from school and hung herself. Oh. So it was, you know, significantly worse year for me than 2020 yeah. was, to be honest. Yeah. Um, we've have been through this. Is It was traumatic. Yeah. And it was a great shock to my nervous system. And I remember the school nurse called after all this happened and said, you know, your daughter's black and blue. We didn't talk about abuse or something in these days. Right. Just, you know, she's black and blue and she's kind of stumbling around and falling off things. You should get her eyes checked. And so my mother was another one of those calls something's yeah. wrong and with great anxiety i was taken to the doctor who found you know i needed glasses and they were like coke bottles yeah but when this all this happened with vision therapy i just you know you wear glasses you go to the doctor you fix it is when i realized my eyes weren't working and she has one pair of glasses and all of a sudden this whole trauma the whole memories are coming back is wow i had some enormous trauma to my nervous system because I was not nearsighted before all this happened. Wow. And to realize that you've affected your brain like this yeah. um, by trauma and that you can actually start to work with it has been very profound for me to realize, to realize me, why <laughs> I, yeah. I had that much Especially at this. Dr. I'm the healer. Yeah. 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 I love that you're saying this because just recently I've done some work with a brain integration therapist, which is again, kind of in this strange realm of not allopathic medicine. And she recommended the exact same thing. And I have an appointment in Chicago with another expert um, that has done exact same thing in January. And I'm going to have that exact same experience of what you're talking about. And I know intuitively it's going to help this. I didn't understand. I didn't know your story. And I'm so glad what you just shared is beyond profound because we're gonna have people listening and realizing these things that happened to us in childhood, we, we're tough, we kind of push them off, but they affect our lifelong trajectory of our career, of our passion for life and of our illnesses. <clears throat> and I love that you're bringing that attention and sharing of your heart because I can't even imagine having, like you said, it doesn't, this year pales in comparison <laughs> to that year for you. It doesn't register yeah, really. right. But when people ask, how can you treat mold? You didn't have mold is, oh, say is, you're like, yeah, I've had <laughs> yeah, yeah. And honestly, I, I love that you're talking that because it's trauma. Mold is trauma in another way. Same thing. So you it is. And, and that is one of the things we'll talk about because it is a trauma and I do have suggestions, but there was I've been through about four different lenses and I think I may have to get another one, but I think during lockdown in May, I had just gotten another pair. And again, I'm having this kind of strange feeling of warmth really right here between my eyes and stuff. And all of a sudden with these glasses, I just had this memory of telling my father, there's something wrong. See a doctor. Wow. And I'm six. He's laughing at me saying, oh, don't worry. There's nothing wrong, dear. I'm fine. It's totally well. I know I saw there was something wrong. And the experience of being laughed at, 
yeah. and not taken seriously had just really shut me down in yeah. sort of my own intuition in that area. And it certainly has been coming uh, much more forward of my recognizing it. So I was going to say is yes, do the vision therapy. I <laughs> yes. love, and I love what you're saying um, here. I literally wrote an article recently about physicians and training and how it's so brutal. We almost have to shut down that part of our intuitive, sensitive self because it is, you you know how it is. The work hours, the abuse that happens, it is, it is literally an abusive situation. I think it's gotten better since we trained, but I remember back and I blocked out some of those memories. But all that to say, a, a lot of the science, we love science. You and I, ICI, the group that we're in, we are all, and we've got some exciting news to share about science and research. So I am a scientist first, but the truth is we are also intuitive spiritual souls on a journey. And that part, when I've tapped into that part of myself, that's where I get profound insight and wisdom for my patients and direction for my life. And just like you're saying, but we were told and taught from a very early age that that's not valuable and that's not okay. And that's not legitimate. And we were made ashamed of that part of ourselves. And what's happening is you and I, and many other doctors are starting to rise up and say, no, guess what? This intuition that we have guides us and we use great science too. We're not, we're not, you know, saying one is better than the other, but I find as I embrace that intuitive side, I get these brilliant insights that only come from that place. And same with you. Completely, completely. And I think learning, I've, the intuition never got fully shut off, yeah. but I did seem to manage to shut off both my normal and, you know, psychic eyesight pretty yeah. effectively <laughs> at an early age. <laughs> exactly. Um, is that the intuition for me has always kind of been there, but I feel my life as I use the word stumbling, I'm stumbling through. Mm-hmm. There's an intuition that guides me. And it's something that I tell to patients, we're going to talk about, you know, the science and getting people to better. But when I, people ask me, you know, it's bad. Last week, I've had like three people discover who are old time old people, yeah. another leak. Mm. And that's, you know, the first one's really bad, but the second or third, it, it, it starts to get really pile up and lots of stresses we talk about. And someone was asking me, it's like, I, you know, I can't do this is, um, and she had at least, you know, decided to go into therapy. And I said, that's really, really good because I've found in my own life and life of people that I watch go through these journeys is that if you can just find some way to listen to, there's a small voice always that is guiding you Mm -hmm. to better help. Yeah. and is looking out for you in some ways and has an idea of why this is an experience that you're learning something here that mm-hmm. you need to learn. And she was very open. I don't say it to everyone, but there are, she was someone who was open and just started crying of like, you know, it's like the possessions, it's so heartbreaking to give away my children's toys at Christmas and stuff. And she said, but I know we are not material things. We're not material in this. And I said, yeah, I've, I've said that to a lot of people that I don't remember any, re, any religion ever saying mm-hmm. that you take your, you know, Christmas tree with you. With you, <laughs> exactly. And if no. something you're learning, experiencing, and can let go of, mm-hmm. that's a profound gift. And, but that is the gift, I think, that you or I are people who are letting ourselves say, yeah, we have intuition, we have psychic gifts. How do you think we you know mold is yeah. important? Exactly. Really? Exactly. Why keep going? Exactly. It's because of the research. No, the right. research isn't there. And I'll tell you that. It's because we have actually felt and seen this is important. This one is, is common and real, and it's really getting a lot of people and probably got me. And I know Julian said it did get you, is is um, it and it really knocks you because you're not looking for mold when you're depressed and tired. So that is one of the gifts I think that when you ask how do people get through this and only we can show this is get over the fear of where there's a little bit more than we think we know that goes on, and if you can just kind of listen to the part that's guiding you is is working with you and hoping you see a more spiritual approach to sometimes you're going to make it. Yeah. You'll make it through this and you'll be in better shape. Exactly. And you'll learn some important lessons. Well, let's talk a little. ICI, you've been, like I said, the co-founder at the very beginning. You've been president. You've really shaped this great organization that's now starting to shift and change 
I want to talk a little bit about what's happening, the exciting Giving Tuesday. Share a little bit about what's happening in the research. Okay. That we are so we've said a couple of times, yes, the intuition is important, but so is science. Right. And um, I've shifted into chairman of the research department, which is something I really wanted to do. And at first I thought, my thought it would be sort of more the grandiose brain. You know, I love the neural quantum mm -hmm. brain and that's my interest a long time. And there has been some started along those lines, but a couple of weeks ago, it's just really, it's been very fast. We were having yet another long discussion on our forum about urinary mycotoxin testing and protocols for it and what it meant and how you would use these results and then which one was the best one. And I just looked at it and I thought, and I'm in a more free position because I'm not doing all the president duties. And I just thought, I'm so tired of everyone guessing at right. this and listening. <laughs> we have to listen to how people feel about these things <laughs> is I just would like to know myself personally, mm -hmm. are any of these tests reliable? Right. Has anyone done split samples of any of these tests, which is totally common in medicine is you have to be reliable. And I have no idea if if we send off split samples, whether they're reliable at a very basic level. I started thinking, what do I want to know on a, what I call a consumer reports approach? Just sort of an independent verification by we are a professional society, we are nonprofit, and we are in the best position to independently assess a test that I, I've never seen more controversy yes. over a test. Um, by various parties involved, pretty nasty things said, things done, you know, it's like, wow, in the absence of data and information, yeah. there's a lot of emotion. And, and so just to clarify, really, um, I've devised a I was going to say yeah. real quickly, just for you listeners, especially if you're laypersons, the bottom line here is we rely on tests in our clinical practice and we base our decisions on results. And so if our assumption that a test is valid is not valid, it changes everything. So I just wanted to frame that and then let you talk about it because it really matters because we trust and we've had labs before that all of a sudden we find out totally bogus and it changes everything. And it's really difficult to tell a patient this lab said they were legit and there's something that came out that it's not legit. So back to you, but I just wanted to share that what the results that we rely on do make a difference in our practice. And we're talking about a test that is controversial even though we think that they're legit. It looks so legitimate. It looks so real. And we base so many assumptions on it. Well, if you show this, that this has happened and this is in your environment, and then you're hearing now this is the binder you should use. It's assumptions on assumptions. And I am, despite intuition, very practical of like, I know that it's very murky at the bottom. And so the tests that um, we've devised and we're working with the University of Arizona School of Public Health there and have been working with them actually for a year with the NeuroQuants to devise a you know, well-designed study that essentially is just going to send off what we call split samples from all the major labs. Um, and we're gonna be doing more is we're going to be sending off essentially the same urine sample to all the different labs from our subjects, meaning um, it would probably be, you know, Great Plains real time. My, maybe my Michael Labs, we have the money, but the vibrant one too. And we're going to, in the same people, show what the results are. And to me, that's another really important part of what I'm proposing is really open and transparent research mm -hmm. is all the data will be available is when we get it, we'll make correlations ourselves and make it available as graphs, but we want to make it available to everybody because one of the things that's bugged me for a long time is you hear studies referred to all the time. This is clinically shown to do this, or in my study, I found this and this is true. And when you actually go looking for the data, you A, may never find it, or evidently it exists, but you're not going to be given it, or somebody did it. At, there are just all these reasons you don't get to see the right. data, and that's not great research. So we want it to be open. We want it to be transparent, and that's really important. What ICI is really about is just transparency of not pretending we know more than we know and trying to get people to think critically. So essentially, we're going to have 
five or six subjects, um, not necessarily ill, but not not ill, mostly reliable people who will follow whatever protocol our membership votes on. If they want to provoke with glutathione and sauna, that's what we're going to do. If they don't want any provocation, we're going to vote on what's the most popular, most common. And we're also then just going to add the diet piece because that is always, you know, why they're dist or, you know, well, it was food. Well, how much food or how long did it stay? So there'll be the food component. Everyone's going to do exactly the same. But we're going to add at the same time for all these people is we're going to collect the samples correctly with the garbage bags for 30 days. So and send those off to two labs that do it so that at the same time we're sending off the urine, we send off the dust samples and we get those back and check to these labs even agree. We really think these must be clean. It's dust, right? right? Um, check those. And then see, is there any agreement at all with what is in their environment with what's coming out in their urine? Mm -hmm. And that's the study. It's a pretty simple one. It's really an observational study. And we just want to do it cleanly, correctly, and be open and transparent and let people see for themselves, is the, are these things really reliable? Should we make all these conclusions? Is there only one that works here? Is it totally random? And we're you know, not seeing is to just give some factual basis for an area in which we kind of freely spend our patients money all the time. And I just want to shout out that you, if you're a listener, you're a practitioner, you want to know more, you can donate. I mean, I, as a board member donated um, just because I believe in this. And so you can go to ICI.org and I'm assuming you can donate right from the website, right, um, Mary? Is that correct? Yes, you can. And I want to say though, is that I was overwhelmed at the response. This is the lab, you know, what we've described, this is what I'd like ICI to be, is just transparent and open and giving information the best we can. Is last year we collected $450, which we're excited about. Yeah. Plus, you know, this year we've actually collected so far and donations are still coming in $27,400. For, $27, wow. It's like ICI is here. Yes. The need. <laughs> for this kind of information about the environment is overwhelming. Is there is what we were once saying in small, you know, corners, yeah, I think you might have mold. It's kind yeah. of a woo-woo thing at that point. I know, point. now we're like, like, no, this is, <laughs> oh. And I see so many colleagues now so jumping many on the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, jumping on the train and talking about, it, and then they'll reference you or I or what, I mean, so it's neat to be, because then when you're the first few talking about it, you, you risk sounding pretty crazy, but it's valid and what's happening. I don't know if you've seen this, I'm sure you have now that people are sequestering their homes. There's the epidemics. I, I don't know if it's just the isolation and the stress as well, but I'm seeing more and more and more cases, um, even more than last year. It's just becoming um, bigger. I'm seeing it both ways. For some people, it's been really, really nice. It's been a COVID blessing um, yeah. in that their homes were clean yeah, and they had made them clean and the problem was work and they're getting so much better in a clean environment where they have the time to devote. So I want to point out there, I have a number of patients. This has been a complete gift is to be able to live in their home. Yeah. Others who have been on the fence because we both know the idea that your home going to require a ton of money for something that you're not sure is real mm -hmm. is not really popular right. and people who've been on the fence who now were forced to spend much more time in it who are getting sicker and sicker it's not the way anyone really wants to learn about this yeah. but it's become very clear it was real uh so yeah i have seen it both ways um and a shout out to everybody is just realizing the people who got better, like my clean environment has yeah. been so important. The people who got worse, unfortunately, is yeah. there's but really a problem. A great and, to, um, to do more. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about was some of the kind of new cutting edge things that you're really have been read up and shared with all of us on. Um, so I want to talk about VIP and then maybe we'll dive into cranial um, cervical instability, which you seem, you definitely really, really uh, understand this probably more than most clinicians. Let's talk first about VIP. So this is way back in Shoemaker days, we all learned about VIP and the value. I'm just gonna say my clinical experience has been mixed. When it works, it works. 
uh, but it doesn't always work. Um, so that there's a little, I would love to hear everything you have to say about VIP. And then I definitely want to talk about, we both saw this recent study. You've been following her longer than me um, because there's drug status from Israel on a VIP that is being used for COVID. So let's talk about that, Dr. Ackerley. Right. So I've been using VIP since I think 2013. And I've actually had really pretty good experiences with a lot of people if you, and I'm going to say if you choose them correctly, is first mm -hmm. of all, the lung issue is very real. And yes. VIP has been known to help with that since the 70s, where when you relax the smooth muscle in the lung, people can take deeper breaths. Um, blood pressure, um, pots like blood pressure will go down, but mostly more oxygen is going to get through the lungs and into the brain. And it's very noticeable. And so I've used it for a long time to help people where we think they've had subclinical um, pulmonary fibrosis or even clinical, unfortunately, pulmonary fibrosis. And I've said, you know, I've had one person waiting for a lung transplant, a couple more with very severe fibrosis who have all been helped tremendously by VIP. Yeah. The cognitive part can be a little more iffy. Um, mm -hmm. And what I found is two things. One in which someone who I was talking to today, who's been a long-term patient said, you know, when I took it, it's like a window opened up and suddenly my brain was working again. I could feel and see, you know, everything that had gone on. But then you remember I got really pretty rageful and, you know, oh. I sort of hit the wall, which was surprising. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, this kind of weird gut issue that nobody quite figure out. So I stopped it. I said, yeah, let's get you back on because I think I know some of it now. So I was the person who, despite um, it always being said there were no side effects, I'd say, nah, you know, I certainly have a population of people who get yeah. suicidal, irritated, mm -hmm. um, dizzy, nauseous with it, with even one or two dosages. It was right around that time I started finding out 2016 about mast cells and yes. VIP. Yes. And it was very clear VIP could make mast cells to your heart say worse. And the people who were getting worse tended to be the mast cell, Ellers downloads hypermobility POTS mm -hmm. patients. So yeah, my experience a whole group of years ago who, or it was more histamine. Again, years ago when I was still very yeah. reactive, my experience was I had more histamine issues with it. And I bet now if I would try it, it wouldn't be the same. But thanks for clarifying because there is someone just asking our chat, are there any side effects? And it's just like anything, there's there's two edges, even though it has great potential. So I told this woman, you know, oh, yeah, I've, I have, I used to talk about this, sensitive people, and I haven't seen these issues in a long time, and why? Because I'm treating mast cells much faster, yeah. and putting people on ketotifin or Neuroprotect, or recognizing it in diets, all the things we do for mast cells, for histamine issues. So when we do VIP, um, they're not having this, and I think in my mind, I've proved it, it was a histamine yeah. issue, mostly in the brain, and I wouldn't put people on it who have mast cell issues until they're feeling stable, in which case they tend to often benefit the most. Again, because of the POTS-like dysautonomia issues, it can tremendously help. So Excellent. I wouldn't be afraid of it. I would just be working with somebody who doesn't go, oh my God, you yeah. know, it's because it's not an oh my God situation at all. Um, it stops within usually an hour or two, especially if you know it's going, it could happen. And it really can, you can basically pre-treat. And yeah. I have followed it because I've had so many people on it through the FDA suddenly deciding they didn't have enough data to do, to work with this. Mm -hmm. And it's very insulting. It's one of the reasons I can get cynical is I have a patient who's waiting for a lung transplant three years off of it with VIP who went to the White House. She, you know, really made a fuss as did the petitions and everything else. The FDA didn't care about what all these thousands of patients with mold mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. um, same thing, but an Israeli drug company, and you know, I think we recognize them as being very smart. New yeah. VIP started using it right away for COVID, which mm -hmm. was a smarter response, yes. I think, IV. And they were getting people off the respirators right away with yeah. it. So they got VIP vast tracked in about March. I call it another COVID blessing where all of a sudden VIP went from almost the do not compound list where I had stopped recommending it. So we always knew it was going to be taken off to fast track. Yeah. Like overnight. It's the yeah. same drug. And <laughs> it's not, that's not rational. Okay. Right. That's drug money and mm -hmm. very insulting to all the Americans who, 
did pour their hearts out, all the research, which wasn't quite perfect, you know, so I'll get off my soapbox, but it gets me angry that it happened. So I've kept a number of people on it through this, knowing the research was going on. The Houston research just came out. Yeah. Uh, it is still quite available as mm -hmm. VIP. Yeah. What's being studied is a um, synthetic compound, yeah. which of course you can do and make yeah, money off. You can't make money off. Nothing. Exactly. So just Hormones. to clarify, because we have a few so, questions on, you mentioned pretreatment. I'm assuming Neuroprotect, Quercetin, uh, Katadafen, you would either get them stabilized or pretreat before H1, you H2, yeah. Yes. Okay. And then and, again, you have yeah. they're the people who probably have to be out of mold. Yes. That, you know, it's always said if you're in mold, you can't do it. Not really true. And the whole thing about Marcons, if you still have Marcons, you can't do it well, we'll be waiting forever for some people. For right, that. right. And then, um, like you said, it's probably just the criteria that kept the, the people that had the mast cell activation, which makes perfect sense. Now, I have not seen right. lipase or amylase be a big issue either, which was originally the thing we were told. Do you check pancreatic enzymes? Yeah, I, I don't. Or, yeah, I do. I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to miss it, you yeah. know, and mostly I think every time it's I've caught it before we went on it and it's been a diet issue, an alcohol issue. It's yeah. usually a clean issue. I've never had to do some sort of workup for cancer or anything. Okay. Yeah. So um, that's the VIP story, but it's a big one. It's, yeah. It is available. And for mold patients, I'm sorry, it's gone through more drama than almost urinary mycotoxins. Yes. And <laughs> I sometimes wonder where, where did I find myself in this land where, you know, crazy oh, things, yeah. crazy in rational sense happen. To well, let's to talk about the, uh, we got about 15 minutes left and I definitely want to talk about cranial um, cervical instability. This, I've had a few patients, you definitely are more of an expert in this than myself or probably anyone else on the ICI group, but let's talk a little about what is it, what do you see with that, how would you treat it, how would you recognize it, let's dive in a little bit to that um, issue. Yeah, and again, that's kind of when you say, why are you interested? It's like, well, that's really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Had you thought about that before? Right. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I think um, I've always been interested in the hypermobility, and it came from the early VIP days, which was, you know, I definitely had the most patience of the group of Shoemaker. I was working closely with Shoemaker. Um, I had the most patients by far who were, quote, having bad reactions. I could not get away with saying my patients didn't have side effects. Right. And why was that? For whatever reason, and I think it's because I'm a psychiatrist, perhaps because from my own history of trauma, I'm okay with people not being totally rational. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, not something that floors me at all, is that people would be attracted, and that's why they had been coming from Michael Gray, and would continue to come, as um, they figured I was sympathetic, and I am. And so the people that tend to have more, what we're gonna call in the neuropsychiatric realm, also are gonna have hypervigilance from their own, you know, Ehlers-Danlos, soft collagen issues. And you begin to see, as I did in others, how often that's connected to mast cells, to POTS and dysautonomia, how incredibly common dysautonomia is when you start to recognize it. And so I've been following that for a long time. And, it's, I've had a couple of patients before it was known um, who did get cervical instability operations. You know, you get basically steel put back here. And I wasn't incredibly impressed um, at, at the results. It's a very scary thing is to have a big piece of metal put there. It's essentially, if you don't understand, is that our brain, you know, and our skull ends right on the top, um, top of our um, basically our cervical uh, spinal cord, but our brainstem runs right through. And that's what carries the messages, our brainstem from the brain to the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And that's where the vagal nerve is, we all talk about, but that's only one of 12 cranial nerves. Um, and they all have to do really with survival, breathing, things you don't think about sweating. Very affected in dysautonomias. And all of us think about mitochondria, nobody's thinking, hey, there's a structural issue here too, um, is if it's, it's really a very narrow passageway here that's coming from the brain to the spinal cord. And you have a lot of impingement, if I could show you, of the um, spinal cord, the little uh, processes sticking out. You have blood vessels running. You have the vagal nerve coming out. You have a bunch of other cranial nerves. And a lot of people, not just people with EDS, but people who've had whiplash mm -hmm. have a tendency 
50 to get a displacement of their what we call C1 and C2, which are supposed to be kind of really nice and straight, mm -hmm. is it tend to slide and they slide into the nerves and slide into the blood supply. And like, yes. So as a doctor, who is thinking about that? It's, right. it's not something we don't think like that. Um, and I think we should. But I think I saw a couple of videos of people with dystonia where they're pretty normal looking, you know, like you or I, and then they're asked to just turn their head and their blood pressure, their blood flow is being measured. Mm -hmm. And as they turn your head, you stop hearing the sound of the blood flow. It's, it's getting wow. fainter and fainter. And then all of a sudden they start their shaking and their dystonia is like this. Mm -hmm. And then they're asked to put their head up and it stops. And really light pulls one off for me because the first thing was, of course, yeah, of course that would happen. And then I thought, I've seen this a number of times. Um, it's always called, it's a pseudo seizure. It ends up in a psychiatric basket. There's no, nothing known to neurology that goes like that and then stops like that just by turning the head. Mm -hmm. Although if they thought, yeah, I'd realize it. So that is the essence of what CCI is. It's a weakness in some ways in the human body of this junction here between the brain and the brain stem and the spinal cord. A lot of like data wires mm -hmm. are um, being transported here through a narrow area and a lot can go wrong with the neck. And mold seems to contribute to the ligament laxity. Yeah. Trauma certainly contributes to it. Ehlers-Danlos people are born with softer collagen and it's being more recognized. And I've been trying to teach people like on the ICI list is to not call functional med, uh, functional neurological stuff is basically the new word for psychosomatic. Right. Um, right. Uh, neurologists know they're not, they're not supposed to call people histrionic, meaning right. just all in the brain. Right. So they call it functional and they treat them kindly and people get better and it doesn't seem as bad as, you know, saying it's all, um, it's all histrionic, which you have to remember MS was considered histrionic yeah. for many, many years is That's um, like that was a histrionic. The psych stuff that you have dealt with as a psychiatrist, now that we know mold and the effect on the brain and I mean, chemicals, mold, environmental toxins, how much of this is really like at the, I, I don't know that there's any true depression without some trigger to brain inflammation and, and dysfunction of neurotransmitters, right? Like it's I so- I think that <laughs> a, couple of other, a couple of other psychiatrists who work the way I do have the same impression is the more you do this, the more you test, the more you work with patients, yeah wonder what is true psychiatry right. anymore. <laughs> is you, I right. watch neuroquants, they're so inflamed or we see yeah. the atrophies. You see how common Lyme and infections are and, and causing psychiatric illnesses. And you really wonder, you know, is there a quote, true psychiatric right. illness? Well, Mary, I have what an is story about that. So I have a, we have a colleague, we both know, I won't make any names, lived in a home with massive mold. Her and her daughter got sick and, and came to me to get improved. And um, later they found out in that home that had stachybotrys, so there was two parts, a newer part and older part. There had been two homicides and a suicide separately in that home. And they wondered like I did, we don't know, but we were thinking there has to be some correlation to this behavior um, and the mold in that house. Now, certainly there could have been predisposed, but that many in that type of framework, and they found this later, this history of this older home. and. And then we think about like our government buildings and our prisons and our schools and how many of these flat roofs are affected by mold. And, and you think about some of the society, like, again, I think about prisons, especially because they already have the hits against them with trauma and difficult childhoods. And I have a lot of compassion because they're probably in moldy buildings too. And I've actually, I have a few prisoners I've, yes. I've treated and um, paranoid quote schizophrenic who turned out to be mold and is, you know, now maintained really nicely. And, and I wrote Brain on Fire like 2014 and probably twice a year, some mother calls about their kid being hauled off for some sort of murder, really violent crime and said there was mold involved. Um, oh, my heart is that out. would be <laughs> on my more, you know, advanced research list right. is with the neuroquants, the inflammation I see when I say that it, there's limbic dysregulation, right. that's a nice word from sort of like the nervous Nelly and, and things are bad all the time to feeling homicide, to rage, right. real right. rage and right. rage can be homicidal. And Absolutely. certainly we see it in marriages and people mm -hmm. interacting and 
you know, so that's there. It's, it's real. And the fact that you can quiet it to help by quieting down inflammation is, is definitely another treatment approach. And it's someplace I would eventually like, I mean, my vision has always been in some ways. I'd like other psychiatrists to just know this is common knowledge and stop getting people on five psychiatric meds before the age of 20, treating something that should have been fixing the roof in the bedroom. Right, um, right. At least I find that if had the good. option of, right? Because you and I use medication, we use psychiatric meds, there's no problem there. But we have to have, we have to educate our colleagues to look for root cause because sometimes it's not a medication deficiency, actually most of the time, right? Well, we just have a few minutes. No, and they're here. like, oh, Go ahead. That medicine made them worse. Yes, it's yeah, called a paradoxical course, right? effect. It's like a whole bar of neuroinflammation. It went down right. the wrong pathway because right. of the massive inflammation. And we can explain it to you. Um, so that is where eventually I think I'd like to, you know, be going with ICI. And, and I probably do have some good news to announce here that yes. is a little bit new. But ICI, it's kind of obvious this year we arrived. Um, I mean, I'm taking some pride here and all of us, the board, we should have a nice Christmas party here is this is so far from where we started and so heartwarming to know that our vision has been shared by so many people now is, um, is that I think there's a, we are working already with the School of Public Health at the University of Arizona. And that's who's been working with the neuroquants. We have one of the professors there who's also a member of ICI and who's going to be supervising what we do here. Is that um, I've been told recently that there probably is a big donor or push to be putting a full center for environmental um, illness at the University of Arizona, which would be a center of excellence. So ICI as a nonprofit would be working very closely there to really train professionals, including psychiatrists and neurologists too. Um, and that would just be, you know, gives me a real twinkle in my eye here of like, yeah, we can just like kind of get people and it's not just mold. It is really, you know, the metal band with no shielding and, and x-rays. It is the fire, the smokes. You and I were both expected, uh, affected by smoke this summer and smoke and how much that affects the brain and all the toxins and the super fun sites. I mean, it's just so overwhelmingly enormous how we expect people to be normal and function yeah. when their bodies, their DNA, their brains have been so affected by toxins mm -hmm. um, without their knowing. Nobody ever really knows that they're being hit by a toxin, Not at all. which is why you don't even know what to do about it, except what we'll call the psychiatrist and they'll give right. us something to quiet her down. Yeah. Oh, this is such a great discussion. Um, we just have like two, three minutes left, but um, what are some things on the horizon? I know we talked a little bit before we got on here about peptides. Um, anything else you see as like uh, pending things that could be instrumental in our practices in changing patients' lives that you're seeing coming up um, for us to watch and, and look at on the horizon? I think there are a lot of things. I think peptides, um, certainly have a ton of potential and people are using them and it is very helpful. I think BPC, I've, you know, we can talk about its effect on collagen and that's really something to think about with ligament laxity, working to strengthen the immune system peptides. Um, I tend to like biohacking tools. So I think methylene blue is a really, really interesting med and being used by some of our colleagues to help Alzheimer's and seeing improvement now. I think um, everything that we can talk about with what I call structural integration body work has the potential. We're talking about visual therapy, lymphatics, um, manipulation, which is what osteopathic manipulation, craniosacral. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see a huge growth as people realize that feeling good is really a good thing for the body, but there was much more going on. So the fascia and how it's affected by toxins is, is important. Um, in some ways, almost everything we look at can probably be helpful because toxins just go like mold yeah. everywhere in the body. And like you, I'm very interested in trying to figure out what's the best thing we can do, the most efficient, the most helpful. But I have to say in some ways, some of the most helpful that I can do for patients and probably you is to just um, 
help them understand, hey, many, many people have been on this journey and it is a journey and people have different journeys and there are support groups. Tucson has the longest running support group. And I, I make jokes because the founders who have been really faithful and have really, really helped in the beginning, there were some of my young, you know, newest yeah. patients there had a lot of what we call marital, you know, discord <laughs> that <laughs> set the stage for me understanding this was totally common. 10 years later, they're incredibly successful running company. I like to tell people, this is not permanent what you're going through. Um, and that's probably the point of all of this is if you're getting appropriate help and you can get an attitude of more than an attitude of gratitude, but gratitude doesn't hurt. Um, an attitude of what am I learning? What am I doing? You know, and not feeling like how horrible, how victimized am I by this happening? You're probably going to successfully navigate it because so many other people have is I think is really a take home here. And there are going to be many things and many things we haven't even talked about yeah. that continue to really help. We're going to have to do part two because we just started scratching the surface. Um, this has been fantastic. And first of all, I want to thank you for sharing your heart and your story. And that really touched me, Mary, just for what you've been through. And it doesn't matter mold or not. It's common to all humanity, the suffering. And when we bring that, that vulnerability yeah. to our practice and say, you know what, we may not have exactly what you have, but we are here to love and support and give you hope because we've been there. We know what it's like to suffer and you and I are in the journey too. So we're just doing our own thing and right. seeking healing. So Thank you. Thank you for all your insights. Thank you for your leadership with ICI. I mean, it would not be where it's at without you, and it's only going to continue. Thank you for taking on the role of the research director. Um, I am just honored to have had this time with you, and thank you, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you, Jill, for helping get the word out because publicity and getting the word out to people is everything of just making it aware again and again, hey, there really is a group here that we're trying to do things um, in a really just kind of respectful, transparent way of we know this is real, of trying to give you the best information, give our clinicians the best information and teach people to distinguish between good information and okay information that might work and really poor information. So all of which exist at the same time. Right, right. And for right, that, right. for that, that is a journey. And you've certainly been on it. You know, you were on the board for a very long time. It's like, you know, as and we are here and this is a glorious moment to just say, it is. you know, it's it's the beginning. <laughs> gratitude for me to you, but to everybody listening and will listen for having the faith in us to donate like this and to keep going when you know um the last meeting someone said oh do we have the money to have you know our our staff we, um do this or something and i just looked at them and said you realize we put out a whole conference and announced it with no money yeah. so really <laughs> yes we can take this risk with yeah. donations and here's where our risk with donations oh, i love it well, thank it you is, it was a lot more risk then yeah so uh and again thanks thank for you for you're welcome and again uh we will post links of the things we mentioned you can find us on youtube and thanks again dr ackerley i will sign off for now